Last Wednesday, the Premier inspected the village and the adjoining parcel of government land. Despite the personal appearance, Mr Griner remained non-committal. Uh, I know the, uh, there is a view that I should come here and simply be like Santa Claus and, uh, and deliver you the land. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have some further discussions this afternoon with some of the people involved. But I do However, the Premier did say that, that giving uh, the land to the Haven would be against we'll public service Saturday advice. Week, and if the thing works out so all the bureaucratic advice uh, is against giving you the land, so I don't want to mislead you about that. That is the overwhelming weight of the public service advice. Today, the Premier revealed he'd ignored bureaucratic advice, choosing instead to play Santa and hand the land over in a trustee arrangement. With the electorate already cynical about electoral bribery, Liberal candidate for Port Stephens, Bob the day Scott, was the election, to deflect. Uh, when there's been no representation for that cheque, as I said, the representations for this land have been going on for some two years. And uh, Arthur Wade and myself made very strong representations, and again, it's been a victory for both parties. OK, that's great. Thanks very much. No worries. Appreciate that. Of course, New World, please champion, champion of the... This extra store represents... <laughs> At 8 o'clock this morning, the work bans began at teaching hospitals across New South Wales. It's a united stand by the RMOs for a better deal, and its effects were felt across the Hunter, with many intending patients having non-elective surgery called off at the last minute, with no indication of how far the But the Mater surgical cases were down 30% with similar reductions at other affected hospitals. The whole dispute revolves around claims by the residents that the working conditions are up to scratch. And the spokesman, Frank Simmons, says he despite guidelines stating residents should work for a week four hours straight, many local hospitals were keeping them on for two days, a gruelling slug that Dr Simmonson's claims can affect medical judgment. He also revealed rates of pay for RMOs were too poor to keep them in the public system. The average resident earns about $25,000 per annum. His equivalent in the private practice earns $40,000 for shorter hours and better conditions. As a result, senior residents are in short supply. One of the key demands surrounding the work bans is that seniors be paid more money in a bid to keep them in the system. However, despite the bans, hospital emergency services have not been really affected. All acute cases are being treated and all residents involved in the bans are working at least one day each week on a volunteer basis. But they still insist the bans will remain until Health Minister Peter Collins uh, recognises their situation and, and they agrees to hold simply talks. Add another layer Tracy of Reed for NPN News. The William IV is operating school tours which continued today despite the events of this morning's run. At 9.30 the paddle wheeler carrying 50 infant school children got into trouble as it came about. Witnesses say tides and winds appeared to sweep the helpless vessel up against the Fitzgerald Bridge. They were panicking, they were starting to move around. Next minute everyone was starting to go down below out of the road, you know, like... Um, and, well, he was singing out, forward or reverse and... The damn thing was in reverse, actually, and it was up against the wires, and uh, they had no hope. As soon as the rigging snared the power lines, teachers ordered the children below decks, and that's where they remained for 15 minutes, playing games and singing songs to keep them calm until trawler boat operators towed the vessel to safety. The vessel came up against a bridge pylon, saving it from more trouble. Although the power lines weren't cut, they suffered sufficient damage to black out several towns, including Seam and Clarence Town, for about 90 minutes. Ship's master Ian McLeod says the incident will be the subject of an inquiry. There are a lot of factors which are very difficult to explain. Uh, the tide, the amount of traffic on the river at the time, the limitations of draft. Uh, it's a very complicated thing. 
it's not something which could be explained very easily. The tours continued along a different route when teachers were satisfied with safety arrangements. Another 700 children will tour William IV tomorrow, but that will remain strictly an inspection only. The vessel won't be leaving the wharf. This isn't the Under first river. time the William IV has hit saw power the lines in earlier this year. Amateur video captured it bringing down lines at Morpeth. The operators paid a hefty repair bill for that error, and if the lines at Raymond Terrace are above the statutory height, it's likely Witnesses they'll have to pay the again. Scattered as I'm Tom Hilston, reporting for NBN News. To happen. Gee, very much. Plans had been drawn up for a marine study centre, but after tenders were considered, the project would have cost more than the 226000 council has in hand. $100,000 had come from the bicentennial funds and the balance from the council. Deputy Mayor Alderman Bob Tusis said today that the council could not find the additional funds to allow the project to proceed. The council will now approach the state bicentennial so, council to discuss the possibility of redirecting the funds elsewhere. Last year, an entertainment complex for Spears Point Park was scrapped after a public outcry. Quarters of a million dollars over the next Last four night's years. appearance on Newsnight was the first time all four candidates contesting the seat had been brought together to discuss the issues. The campaign up until then had been led by the political heavies from Sydney, an indication of how important the major parties consider this marginal seat. Issues range from the neglected Nelson Bay Road, the question of a sewerage levy for the electorate, and of course the proposed cuts to teaching positions next year. But it was the land handover to the Harbourside Haven Retirement Village which touched the nerve and sparked claims of That's personal right. and negative campaign will tactics. Set the agenda in this camp. Harbourside Haven, I did six and a half years on the board there. Every one of those buildings except one was built while I was on the board. I have always worked for that uh, retirement village. There were 800 pensioners, 800 pensioners on the waiting list at Harbourside Haven and Mr Martin, through political bloody mindedness, tried to keep those people out of Harbourside Haven. He tried to give the poor in the community or stop them getting a roof over their head at a reasonable price. The Liberals' campaign's been very negative, very personal attacking. We've been positive, we're keeping it on the rails. The people, you're scaring the pensioners, you frightened the children with your octopus out last time and now you're trying to scare the pensioners even. I mean, Mr Martin has got to stop his scare campaign. No okay. one's having a crack at him. You're looking at 34,000 electors, not just 800. And the, the issue there, I, I believe that the parties are so busy getting involved in this slinging and character assassination, <laughs> and both parties are doing it, that people are sick and tired of it. I certainly am, and it's one of the reasons I'm running. Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> He's been fooling around literally with magic for more than 20 years. Like most children, he was fascinated by the sleight of hand, and he started to haunt magic shops, picking up new ideas for a traditional top hat and tails act that he performed for whoever would sit through it. But as the act progressed, Hubert wanted something to separate him from other tricksters. Something a little unusual. At work one day. Superman came to the rescue. Wow. What My image? Hey, I suppose it's very, very sedate, quiet, easygoing person. Isn't that right, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I suppose i got a bit of a wild image. <laughs> The Houdini Award may be Super yeah, Hubert's chance to really start producing a few dollars. As part of his award, he will perform for a week at the Magician's <laughs> Castle in Hollywood, Magician's Mecca. Hubert is a little worried that he may have to tone down his act for the Americans. Do you think they might think that you're from another planet? Oh, from Australia, yeah. I'll say that everyone's like me in Australia, especially in Newcastle. <laughs> Foot rot costs New South Wales an estimated $50 million every year in the wool industry alone, $24 million in lost wool production and $26 million in damage to sheep. It also affects goats, deer and cattle. The disease grows and is carried in animals' feet and is highly contagious. It is passed on via the soil, infected ground remaining contagious for several days. It is most virulent in wet, lush conditions. According to the Department of Agriculture, however, there is no reason the state need put up with foot rot at all. A one-hour presentation on the Sky Channel network this morning was the first salvo in a full-scale war against the disease, a war which the department hopes it will have won by the year 2000. Primary producers at 60 venues across the state heard from rural experts and had the opportunity to phone in questions, which were answered over the air. Around 50 local goat and sheep breeders watched the launch at the Tanamba Tavern. Following the presentation, a demonstration by the experts of identification and treatment of the disease. The Department of Agriculture has been given new powers to combat foot rot. From December, any farms containing the disease in the Hunter will be able to be quarantined. According to Stuart King from the department, however, the program will only work with the support of producers. The main thing that hinders foot rot eradication is people are firstly admitting that they've got the disease. Once they can admit that they've got foot rot and then they apply the treatments that have been worked out over many years, it's quite possible. Why does New South Wales need to be rid of foot rot? Chamber of Commerce and Council members joined representatives from the Hunter Development Board at the meeting to discuss the airport proposal. Lake Macquarie Mayor Alderman Ivan Welsh says the project appears to have lost some momentum and the meeting was designed to get it moving again. Those in attendance unanimously carried two motions. Well, the first one was that this uh, meeting unanimously supported the uh, International Airport with uh, Williamtown being the preferred site and the second one was that this uh, meeting would uh, call on the Premier to assist with the bulk of funding for a survey to be carried out to uh, assess the needs. $25,000 and local councils will be among the organisations also asked to contribute. Gordon and Welsh says the Hunter Airport project should take precedence over plans at Badgeries Creek or Mascot Airport, adding an extra runway could be provided at Williamtown for the same price but with less effect on the general public. While conceding there will always be opposition, Alderman Welsh believes most approve of the project saying the economic future of the region relies on people supporting development. Although the aim is to get a fully operational international airport at Williamtown, the proposal may have to be developed in stages. Yeah, that may be freight first and then when the people became accustomed to the fact that this wasn't hurting, then perhaps we could upgrade it to uh, commercial passengers as well. There is opposition to this sort of...
going to go down the good. Almost 200 riders from four years up to 25 years competed in the Jamboree, adding weight to the New South Wales Pony Club Association's claim to being one of the state's biggest youth clubs. Despite rising costs, especially in transport, the Pony Clubs have maintained loyal membership. In many cases, enrolments are way up. And there was even a new club making appearance at the Jamboree, young riders from Mount Sugarloaf. They were up against some able contestants, including last year's point score trophy winners, Raymond Terrace. But past performance doesn't influence the judges, several of whom have had Royal Easter Show experience. The Jamboree has been held in Zone 25 for 17 years, but it's the last time Mount Hutton will host the event at this ground. The ponies will soon have to make way for the motor car when a new highway goes through. However, Lake Macquarie Council is making arrangements for a new club venue well before Mount Hutton hosts its next Jamboree in about 10 years' time. Senior figures in Toronto's Chamber of Commerce say it's only a question of time before the Main Street becomes a permanent mall. In the meantime, the Christmas caper gives local retailers a glimpse of the future and a chance to consider some of the issues associated with the project. Toronto shopkeepers eagerly joined in the spirit of the fair, demonstrating their support for the local identity of the shopping centre now under threat from the larger shopping complexes springing up across Lake Macquarie. This is also the last chance for local shoppers and shopkeepers to contribute their ideas to the new Toronto Townscape Survey. Already the majority of comments appear to favour a strong Australian theme for the mall project. Any move towards creating a mall won't happen overnight. The Chamber of Commerce envisages a five-year transition, but even on that timescale, visitors to next year's Christmas caper could see dramatic changes. The blustery Northeaster made the 18-hole championship a little tricky for the competitors. Favourite on the day, Gail Gannon, seen teeing off here on the 11th, wasn't too phased though, hitting the ball with great strength and timing. Merriweather champion Carolyn Pawley and Sue Wilson, who with a handicap of three was the second rated player, were also amongst the field of 94. At the end of 18 holes, Pawley and Gannon were level with a 76-4 over the card. After a four-hole playoff, the Newcastle Merriweather champion Pawley outshot Waratah champion Gannon to win the cup. At Mayfield Bowl, they were aiming at a different kind of pin in the Bicentennial Pro-Am tournament. 110 bowlers took part, 22 were celebrity players. Politicians, media and sports people bowled them over in Australia's only Bicentennial 10-pin bowling event. Any profit made today goes to the Mayfield Salvation Army. Wave performance sailing is when the sailors throw caution to the wind, trying the highest and most radical manoeuvres they can to impress the judges. Yesterday's slalom around a set course was won by Sydney's Mark Pedersen, with local sailor Andy Regan impressive in third position. 
The field of 40 was narrowed to Australian champion Rowan Cutmore and his runner-up Pedersen in the Wave Performance Final. Conditions were ideal for spectacular sailing, and with the strong northeaster blowing, the two top wave sailors in Australia worked through their repertoire of tricks. Cudmore eventually won in a tight decision. The Canadian sailor and 1987 world champion Anit Graveline defeated Sydney sailor Jessica Crisp in the women's final. The rise follows a change of policy by the state government. In the past, the compulsory rebate scheme was directly funded by the council and the government with a maximum concession of $175. A voluntary scheme was also directly funded. Maybe $300,000? Okay, say so! Indicate to the people out there that all we're going to spend. The state spend. government yeah. has now withdrawn. The, the, um, Instead, it's directing the same money into the compulsory scheme increasing the maximum rebate to $250, believing this will benefit the majority of ratepayers. Lake Macquarie Council has not altered the level of its contributions, but there is an obvious shortfall due to the government's strategy. In some cases, $80 more than they're currently paying. Uh, but in the main, it would be no more than $65. And that's purely because the state government has withdrawn that rebate. Is there any way that the council could have made up the shortfall? There is no way the council could have made up the shortfall. As I said, the number of eligible pensions are increasing at a dramatic rate. If we were, if we were to meet that, it would have been a, a, an intolerable burden on the rest of the ratepayers to have borne that additional uh, levy that uh, has been uh, uh, reallocated by the state government. The Combined Pensioners Association says it doesn't blame the local council, but the fact remains some pensioners will be badly penalised through no fault of their own. It's all right to say that it's tolerable. It may be tolerable for those people who can live a reasonable life, but there are many people, especially widows, who uh, living in their own home, their costs are the same in lots of cases, and uh, if they're living on a base pension, they're going to find it damned hard. In the control room of the Newcastle Fire Brigade, which meters calls from Newcastle and Lake Macquarie, operators received the monthly average of 500 calls in August. In September it increased to 900 and in the month of October 1,439 calls for help were registered. 85% of those were for bushfires. It's definitely the danger season. In the last few years good spring rain has eased the problem, but unfortunately this year it has stayed away, at least until today. It's a combination of, of weather uh, and low humidity. The the past years, August adversely has been our bad month, it's been dry, the humidity's been low, we've had the winds, but it's gone on now from August, September, October, and here we are halfway through November, still the same. Is it going to get worse? Apart from today, uh, I would say yes, it's going to get worse before it gets much better. 175 full-time firemen and some 250 volunteers have been stretched to the limit. District Officer John Waldy, who has never seen a situation so critical in his 22 years in the brigade, is philosophic as to the cause of the fires. In fact, as I think the people have um, probably a little careless. They've, they're not used to the prolonged dry spell and uh, their carelessness is, is showing up with the extra fires. But as John says, the firefighters need public support to help win this battle. You should uh, dial triple R. There are other local uh, bushfire brigades that have numbers there, but Triple O comes to this regional control. You can see the setup behind you here, and that's the first thing you do report the fires. The second thing is to be careful when you're out in the bush. Extinguish all fires, uh, take note of when there are total fire band days, extreme fire conditions, and as I said, report any fire to Triple O.